Well, first of all, I'd like to say th thank you for inviting me to, uh, to come visit this time. This was the second attempt to get, to get me out here, and this finally successful attempt. My, uh, my goal here today is to sort of talk about some of the, give you kind of a, a smorgasbord in some sense of some of the work that we've been doing uh, with myself and my group listed here on looking at a sort of a, what we think is a very important effect on a plasma sheet dynamics and plasma sheet uh, coupling, and especially on the inner magnetosphere. And this is the effect of these bubbles that I'll, I'll allude to in a, in a minute. Uh, a lot of the work I'll be showing is work that's been done mo not by me, mostly by, by research scientists or by, by my students. Um, I'm just here to present it and, and, uh, and hopefully make, make some sense of it uh, for you. So my goal is to sort of get basically sort of talk, give you some motivation as to why um, this is important, uh, and, the, and the goal is, our ultimate goal in terms of magnetosphere physics is understanding how the inner magnetosphere evolves, forms, and a lot of that is affected by its interaction with the plasma sheet. So this interaction within the plasma sheet and the ring, plasma sheet and the ring cone is very important, and, and the mechanism that sort of seems to be becoming, we think, very important are these, are these low entropy bubbles as well, and I'll talk a little bit about what this means. I'll try to give you some, some background about what the entropy parameter is. And then we'll talk a little bit about the actual tool that we've been using over the years, this thing called the RCME. I'll describe that in a minute, what it does. Um, show you some results, what are the things it can do uh, uh, in terms of what, what it comes to the physics we've been able to get out of it over the last few years. And then launch into sort of some of the work we've been doing more recently. This is sort of the newer stuff of um, looking at the effects of these bubbles and bursts on several things, uh, including how the inner magnetosphere changes, especially the ring current. Uh, also on, on these things called waves that have been observed, these so-called buoyancy waves. And I'll talk a little bit about a new theory that, that we've recently developed that attempts to, at least to begin to describe what these things are. There's a little, very little, little studied in the magnetosphere. And give you some preliminary results of using that insight that we've learned from this understanding of the waves to talk about a new version of the, this thing called the Rice Convection Model that includes a, a, an inertial effects that is trying to simulate some of the wave structures that we're seeing as well, and then I'll finish up with a, with a summary. So the ring current and plasma sheet is sort of, this is sort of the typical cartoon view that you often see, looking down on the equatorial plane, the sun is always to the left. Um, ar arrows sh show flow, these sort of hollow arrows here, and, and the dark arrows show field lines. Uh, typically the way it works is you have convection uh, from the tail, so um, moving into the inner magnetosphere, that eventually um, um, is sort of a sunward motion that eventually turns into sort of a sunward motion around the magnetosphere. The thing that's sort of interesting of interest to us is during sort of very disturbed events such as magnetic storms, um, this strong convection drives the plasma sheet, makes it very disturbed, and also affects the, wing, the way the wind current forms and, 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 and develops as well. Um, and specifically in the inner magnetosphere, the, the important physics that's driving plasma motion is not just simply E cross B drift in the traditional plasma physics sense, there's also uh, energy dependent uh, gradient and curvature drifts that become, become, a, become a crucial role. To set the stage, um, talk a little bit about some theory. Um, one of the underlying sort of major sort of theoretical power, uh, envelopes that sort of determines the physics of this system is this thing called the entropy, entropy parameter which is defined by this equation here, where P is the plasma pressure, B is the magnetic field. It's basically the integral of, uh, of a flux tube over, 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 um, over an entire field line. You can show in ideal MHD that this entropy parameter, if you follow it along a streamline, for example, this would be a flow streamline in the equatorial plane. If you were to calculate S along that streamline, it would be uh, conserved. Uh, in a more restrictive sense, if you have an equilibrium system where the magnetic field is force balance, then this entropy called uh, S to the gamma, or often referred to as PV to the gamma, is also conserved, um, and where V, like I said, is a flux tube volume as well. Um, what's been, why this is an important parameter is if you, if you plot the entropy parameter in the inner magnetosphere, the gradient of that parameter as a function of position determines this stability criterion called interchange. So here's an example taken from a, a paper by, by Yang a few years ago where he calculated this entropy parameter from an um, empirical magnetic field model. And what you typically find is this entropy parameter basically increases as you move out away from the Earth. If you have the reverse situation where the entropy parameter decreases as you move in, then it becomes what's known as interchange unstable, where flux tubes will try to mi minimize the energy and then interchange and it'll result in sort of some, some kind of instability process. Typically, the plasma sheet is seen to be statistically 
is um, on any given average time is typically stable against um, interchange. When things is no, when it's no longer interchange stable, then it, then it becomes um, interesting. One example of an interesting thing that happens is if you plot the entropy parameter from models, and you plot the entropy parameters, the flow lines from some typical uh, convection model. This shows the flow lines. This shows a typical entropy parameter. It's typically measured from some statistical model. This is a, um, and typically because I, as I mentioned earlier, this entropy parameter should be constant along a flow streamline. But if you look at this plot and look at this plot, the, field, the, the lines are actually not along each other, they're actually perpendicular to each other, which suggests that you have a problem here. Um, the system is basically not um, satisfying this entropy parameter. And this apparent contradiction in uh, empirical and uh, in kind of using a, in a theoretical view uh, was discovered back in the 1980s by Erickson and Wolf and was coined back then the so-called uh, pressure balancing consistency. So basically what I'm trying to say is that this line here and this line here are not, are not parallel to each other um, and that is, a, that is a problem. And so how to resolve that problem is part of what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. The way I'll be talking about it is by talking about a model, a theoretical tool that was developed over the years and have been using is this thing called the Rice Convection Model. You've probably heard of the Rice Convection Model um, by itself. The Rice Convection Model Equilibrium is a modified version of that. So the, RCM, the RCME basically models the inner magnetosphere. Uh, it base, has some several assumptions about how it works. It assumes slow flow, uh, isotropic distribution, and the plasma distribution. Uh, most, it assumes most of the particle populations are kil kilovolt type particles that influence the magnetic field and the structure of the inner magnetosphere. And the important drifts of the system are controlled by, especially in the inner magnetosphere, as I mentioned before, uh, gradient and, um, and curvature drifts. The E part of the RCM, which is the part that's sort of relatively new and probably not so well known, is that the, one of the inputs to the traditional RCM is the background magnetic field. Typically, it's an empirical model, say an ENCO model, or whatever. Uh, what we use here is rather than doing that, we actually compute the magnetic field self-consistently by assuming that, that calculating the pressure to be in force balance with the, with the, um, with the pressures computed by the moments from the, from the rise convection model using a, basically an MHD code to do the calculation as well. And that's where the force equilibrium comes in. Okay, just an example of, this is some early work that was done using some, one of the early versions of the RCM. I mentioned earlier that, that convection from the plasma sheet drives ring current and ring, ring current formation. So the goal, this was a work done by a student of mine, um, he actually used the RCME with the full machinery using the self-consistent electric field and magnetic field to drive basically strong, steady adiabatic convection from the plasma sheet into the magnetosphere. The goal was to try to create a strong ring current injection. What we found instead was that we didn't get anything like a ring current injection. What happened was that as, you, as, the, as the plasma moved in, uh, and this is the entropy parameter plotted in the equatorial plane, these are flow streamlines, as the plasma moved in, the magnetic field and the electric field responded in a fashion to basically uh, push, stop that stuff coming in. Basically, it would push it out. So you basically would get an inductive field, if the, if the pressure came in, the magnetic field would stretch, then the, and basically it would push the plasma out. Same thing would happen with the electric field. We got nothing like a ring current injection. Um, we got nothing like uh, a storm in the model. No matter how we, hard we pushed it. He ran this thing for, for almost 12 hours with strong convection and, not, and no ring current injection happened. Um, what you did find was a very strange looking result. If you plot the magnetic field in the equatorial plane along this line axis, you get the strange BZ minimum. The magnetic field typically declines as a function of distance down the tail. What we found here was that actually there was a minimum in the magnetic field, which has been observed, but not very often. It's kind of a rare phenomenon. It's typically seen around um, right before a substorm, in the substorm growth phase. They often sometimes see that, and that seems to be what we've managed to generate in this code as well. So this was kind of a puzzle, and I'll get back to that in a little bit about how we, uh, we tried to resolve that. Other fun things you could do with this is also what's observed in the ionosphere during a strong growth phase is a growth phase arc. This is a very strong arc that basically is equated with a line that forms um, during a growth phase of a substorm. Uh, using the RCME and looking at basically constructing a sort of a synthetic type aurora from the RCM, what we found was indeed you do get something that looks like an arc. This is a synthetic aurora based on um, upward current 
basically computing the, 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 the sort of synthetic type aurora, you found these sort of uh, these, these arc-like structures that were forming as a result of the field line currents that were being created by this convection in the plasma sheet. These field line currents were basically being formed about the, because of this choking of the flow, this plasma trying to come in, being choked um, by the magnetic field and electric field. That choking basically turns, stops the plasma from coming in, and basically what it does, it turns it around. So this is sort of a cartoon view of what I mean. This is a quiet view. This is sort of the iron, it's a typical iron drift trajectory during quiet times. When you push the system hard, with this sort of strong growth phase convection, all these drift trajectories kind of fall on top of each other. You get a very sharp drop off of plasma pressure, which is called the measure of the plasma sheet. The associated region one and region two currents that form, uh, are, we think, are connected to this to this arc, and so this formation of this region one current. So this was sort of a nice explanation for um, what the growth phase arc, where it came from. For where, where that inner, inner edge forms? Yeah. It depends very much on um, what you assume for your plasma sheet boundary condition. So the temperature of the plasma sheet pretty much determines it. We typically use some kind of statistical model. Um, often we find statistical models don't work very well. And you have to tailor, for if you're doing an event, for example, which we've done, then we have to basically play with that. And that'll change where that location uh, typically forms. Uh, usually it's around. Um, if you go back to here, usually it's around where this around 13 RE or so. Okay, so 10, 10, so 10, and 10 and 13, something like that. But again, it varies on the, depends on temperature, it depends on um, where it forms. So. Um, another recent example of using RCME is um, uh, using it to be, dri to be driven from um, the LFM, which I guess many of you probably know what that is, the LFM MHD code. So this is a student of mine did this where he, she used R RCME, but instead of using a statistical or made up plasma sheet boundary condition in magnetic field, she used the MHD magnetic field and ran the same event, but ran the RCME as a boundary. And then showed the, and basically ran them side by side. So what you're looking at here is a comparison plot of uh, RCM LFM, which is uh, showing the, the, the pressure in the equatorial plane, and then the same for the same time showing the RCME result um, using basically LFM magnetic field for the outer magnetosphere, RCME magnetic field for the inner magnetosphere, having the RCM compute its own electric field rather than using the MHD magnetic field because the RCM's electric field is a, a, a lot more refined. And you get a very different looking magnetosphere in the sense that the ring current pressure, it's hard to see, but the scales here, the pressures here are about a factor of five lower than the pressure you typically see in the, um, in the LFM RCM. The system is a lot more stable and a lot more dynamic from using the sort of, what I think is a more accurate electric field. Um, another measure of the difference between the differences between the codes is computing a, a quote DST for this is a simple idealized event uh, showing the um, RCM LFM, which is the red, and then the RCME, which is the blue, showing a much uh, less enhanced ring current because of this uh, finer fidelity in the electric field. The green curve is using RCME, but instead of having RCM compute as electric field, we use the electric field from the MHD code, but we use the RCM magnetic field. And this basically illustrates that the big difference between these two is the electric field model can play a big role in how big the ring current forms and how big a ring current injection you get in the system. So to, to move on to sort of the, 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 the topic of how important bubbles are, I'll, I'll set the stage about what exactly these things are and why they're important. This was first speculated back in 1980 by uh, Pontius and Wolf. Um, and what he found was, and this is basically an interchange process, if you take a, a region of the plasma or a flux tube and you reduce the entropy in that flux tube and you make it lower than its background, it, it automatically becomes interchange unstable because the gradient is no longer increasing as you go out. So what it wants to do is it basically wants to move in to the inner magnetosphere and um, find an equilibrium position in the inner magnetosphere. Um, and it can produce some fairly large um, velocities. Uh, these things are, uh, were later observed by, by uh, Baumjohan in, in, um, um, using geotel data. They actually saw these very fast, very short-lived flow bursts. These, become, these can actually move very quickly. And so the idea was that this, uh, this, because they're so prevalent, they should have somehow be included in the kind of modeling effort that we're doing. And so the goal in sort of the next, sort of the next stage of the work that we did was try to represent uh, 
some kind of effect of, of bubble or these low entropy bubbles in the rice convection model equilibrium RCME. And the way we do that is we basically, because the RCM is designed as a code to strictly enforce um, uh, entropy conservation, um, it, 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 we can use it to track these bubbles individually within the system and follow them in very, very carefully and very, very precisely. Um, and we do that by basically modifying our outer boundary condition. We have sort of a statistical or, or made up boundary condition that we use, and we estimate what that boundary condition should be based on statistics. There are also these bubbles are also observed to be moving in very rapidly, varying speeds to hundreds to t many hundreds of kilometers per second. We don't have a model for that, so we basically use a statistical model to basically modify the boundary condition for the flow in the inner boundary as well. And we use a prob probability distribution of the flow at the boundary based on the work by Wang using a geotile data to basically uh, calculate what the boundary condition for the rise convection model is. So here's an example of the kind of boundary condition we use for the flow. So this would be a sort of a, a V versus probability density function of the kind of flows that are observed in RCM with BBFs and RCM imposed with BBFs. So the RCM without BBFs, which is this blue curve, is that first very first RCME result that I show with a steady convection. The flows are typically are, are slow uh, and average around great, less than zero, but typically are not very widely dispersed. What's observed, according to Geotail, uh, is more like this black curve, which is very widely spaced, lots of, lots of very small, high-speed flows. So what we did in the, in the model, we, we basically added a boundary condition in the flow, which tried to mimic the statistical probability function of these bubbles. So the idea is to basically model uh, plasma sheet um, formation or plasma sheet motion and in current injection using a uh, boundary condition that's based on statistics and try to then calculate what it does for the inner magnetosphere. And the result is shown here. This is actually a movie showing the entropy parameter as a function of time. This is in the equatorial plane. This shows the associated flow speeds in, in, um, in kilometers a second. So you get some very fast, uh, fast flow speeds. Um, I get these because they're, they're actually pushed in. But you, every now and again, you see these bubbles coming in to the inner magnetosphere that are basically make their way. Here's one, for example, that it opens up, goes right in into the magnetosphere. So what's happening here is rather than plasma being choked in the traditional convection framework that we often see, here we actually see a very strong uh, convection and a very strong buildup of ring current injection. Um, and depending on what we pick for the boundary conditioning, we can get a very different looking configuration. So what happens when you now look at the, the resulting plasma sheet configuration, you end up with a very different looking result. So what's plotted here on, on the left is the, um, the, the so-called entropy parameter as a function of distance down the tail, showing the case for the, um, uh, the empirical model, which is, the, which is basically observed. The blue line, which is uh, the model that I showed you earlier with the RCM with steady convection. And the red model is the one where we added these artificial or made up flows and artificial entropy parameters. And what you see is that on the average, using this extra um, boundary condition and effect, we end up something which is closer to, to what's observed. If you look at the magnetic field now, it's also very different. The magnetic field without the flows, which is in the blue, which is like what I was showing you earlier, you get this rather odd BZ minimum in the magnetic field that's, again, not often observed. The, flow, the run with the RCM using the, 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 the um, diversity flows is shown in red. The, the BZ minimum is, is no longer there. Um, and it's actually, at least in my eye, closer, at least in structure, to what's observed, at least in an average empirical sense. So what this is sort of telling us in, in sort of a conclusion is, is that um, by adding these, these, these effects of low entropy bubbles, where instead of having smooth laminar flow in the system, you have this kind of bursty, sporadic flow coming in from the tail, you can resolve this long-standing um, puzzle that's been in the manuospheric physics, which is this so-called um, pressure balancing consistency. You no longer have that if you, uh, if you allow this sort of structure to form in, 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 the, in the tail, and it affects the plasma sheet. The other kind of benefit of this is if you look at the, region, the field line currents that you get from the model, uh, what we find is in, in a traditional RCM using traditional boundary conditions and variable magnetic fields, you get very sharp, well-defined region two currents, which typically are much sharper than what's observed. If you add the bubble effects, what happens is that these bubbles actually spread out and become a lot more realistic, and which is what's shown in, in the model 
in this example here. So it's another sort of another side benefit from adding these, these effects as well. Another thing that's sort of been in the, in the community in the last few years are these things called rural streamers. Uh, these are basically uh, rural type structures that basically are seen in the night side magnetosphere. They typically um, start somewhere on, on the day side and make their way towards the inner magnetosphere and hit the, the, the night side of rural oval. These have been seen for, for many years. Um, and it's associated with some kind of strong upward current in the system. Uh, the speculation that we came up with was uh, if we have, if you have a, a bubble in the system, these low entropy bubbles, what would be the ionospheric footprint? What would they look like in the ionosphere in, 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 terms, of, in terms of field line currents, in terms of a rural structure, and so on? So here is actually a, a movie showing, it actually shows a lot of things, but on the left here shows the equatorial view. The right here shows the ionospheric view of the same thing. Top shows the entropy parameter. This shows the associated field line currents. And the bottom one shows a sort of a, a synthetic aurora that we basically take in from the upward current in the, in, in the system. So what happens is that when we add the bubble, and I need to go back and rerun this, and you'll see this. So when the bubble is added, you'll see this, this low entropy bubble come in here. Um, and it, it creates a field line current structure associated with it because of the reduction in plasma. And you end up also with a thing, thing that looks like, to some extent, looks like a streamer that starts on the night side and makes its way all the way down to, to, the, to the night side plasma sheet. You also see the arc structure that was shown earlier as well. So again, this is sort of a nice sort of explanation of where these streamers are coming from. They, we think they're associated with these bubbles that, that, are, that, are, that are seen. Yes, yeah. Well, it's, it, this, this calculation is, is it's a very sensitive calculation uh, because it's, this, it's, it, it's come from the Vassilinus equation, which is the gradient of two great cross, cross product of two gradients. So it's a very, very noisy, very sensitive calculation. So any structure in the system, any structure in the pitot line current, any structure in the magnetic field is going to show itself in the field line current structure as well. And that's what's happening in, the, in, this, in this plot as well. And I think also what he's done, I think he's blown up the scale quite a bit to actually emphasize these structures, you see them a lot more, more brighter as well. This is a good question. This is, um, there's a, the, you've heard this, this the, uh, Nishimura talk about the association between streamers that form on, on, the, on, the, on the night side, and when these streamers impact the night side or all oval, substance goes off. Okay, that's what they've talked about. Um, we don't have the physics. We don't think we have the physics for substorms in there. Uh, but I think there is a very strong connection in the sense that these bubbles that are being formed are probably, they're reduced entropy bubbles. They're reduced by somehow plasma pressure is being reduced in the bubble. The obvious mechanism is reconnection. So if you have some kind of sporadic reconnection on the night side, which forms this low entropy bubble, it's then going to be associated with the formation of a substorm. Typically, what's seen in, in, in these things is when they, you know, observations, when they make their way to the night side, not always, but much of the time, a substorm goes off. Miracle occurs. These are ahead. Of these are the head. These are, this would be the head of a bubble going into the inner magnetosphere, hitting, impacting the inner magnetosphere, and perhaps triggering some instability that we don't know what it is that triggers a substorm. We don't know what it is, we don't know, but it certainly is an association. The problem is it's a controversial subject because we don't always see a substorm when we see a bubble. Depends who you ask, uh, right? But here we put one in, we see that we see, actually see the effect as well. It does impact and make the inner magnetosphere very unstable. If you look at the state of this system uh, towards the end of this, this growth phase, it is very unstable, at least to, at least to MHD ballooning, I found. Uh, it's not a spectacular instability, but it certainly is unstable, and something's waiting for it to happen. What it is, that's a $64 question when it comes to substorms. So, so. Um, another question that, that, that this is work by, by, by Jan Yang. Another question that Jan Yang asked is, you have these low entropy bubbles that are basically appear to be doing a lot of the transport for the inner magnetosphere, uh, seen all the time, but they don't carry much plasma, much density with them. How can they basically build up a ring cup? You basically, it's an empty tube. You bring it into the magnetosphere. How can that build up a strong pressure ring current? 
So the question that the Jan did was he basically ran a, um, a many RCME simulations. And he basically, what he did was he tracked, every time a bubble crossed the boundary, he would track if it came into the boundary and where it came from. And the idea was he was trying to figure out if you have a certain region in the plasma sheet or in the ring current, how much of that pl ring current is of that plasma came in inside a bubble as opposed to being already there as opposed to coming in from a non-bubble boundary. And the idea was that if most of the ring current is built up by bubbles, you would find that most of the energy, in this case, is made from bubbles, not ring current. And this is exactly what he found. The, uh, the black line here shows the total energy. The red line shows the amount of plasma that was brought in, percentage of the ring current or fraction of the ring current that was brought in by bubbles. And then the, the red, the, um, excuse me, the green and blue curve were either pre-existing plasma that was already there in the inner magnetosphere or came into the inner magnetosphere across a non-bubble boundary. The conclusion was that at least, at least 60%, depending on the strength of the storm, uh, of the ring current comes in not it comes in as some kind of bubble manifestation, even though it's a low a low uh, entropy, even though it's low content flux tubes. Um, same thing also goes for the for the density as well. A significant fraction of the ring current comes in from these bubbles. So it's sort of an important effect in terms of what's going on. So so one question that kind of comes up is, you, um, there are many ring current models out there, and for many years they've been producing ring currents DSTs that sort of look like observations. And they typically don't worry about these things called bubbles that I've been talking about. Why do they get why do they get ring currents, and why do we have to put a bubble in the ring current in order to produce a ring current? And so this is an experiment that also Jan Yang did. Was he basically ran um, two versions of the RCME? Uh, one is where he placed the RCME at the typical nightside boundary, sometime somewhere in the plasma sheet, where he had lots of bubbles. And then he also then um, ran another version of the RCME, but he placed the boundary not at 10 to 15 RE, but closer to where the traditional ring currents model, where they place it typically around geosynchronous, which is 6 RE. And he took the average plasma boundary conditions that he got from RCME at 6 RE and used that as his outer boundary. Okay. So the idea is that if you had a ring current model at 6 RE without bubbles, do you still get a ring current? And if you have an RCME where you have a, a ring current model, but you place the boundary outside, uh, do you get a ring current? And the difference is, from the region between, between 15 RE and 6 RE, the bubbles usually make their way into the inner magnetosphere, and they typically start the gradient curvature drift to dissipate, uh, and dissipate within the background because of the strong gradient curvature drifts. So the conclusion was that what he found was that if you run, um, and I'll show you the result, if you run RCME, with the bubbles, and you take the boundary condition at 6 RE, which is this boundary right here, which has no bubbles, because by the time they make their way in there, the bubbles are gone, they've dissipated. You take the boundary condition here, and you use that to calculate the boundary condition for that, you get basically also a ring current. The, the, the bottom line, or the take home message to this, is that the region between 6 and 15 is kind of that no man's region, that in order to make its way for plasma to make its way in from here to here, it has to be a low entropy plasma pl flux tube. By the time it makes it into 6RE, because of gradient curvature just being so important, it, bubbles are not really important. So you can get away with placing your boundary at 6RE and still get a ring current. But if you were to place your boundary at 15 or 20RE like we've done, you don't. And the reason is because the bubbles are needed to get from here to here. And it's kind of like what they often call the, the so-called transition region from dipole region to tail-like region, this no man's land region here is crucial in terms of getting the physics right. And that's why they've been able to do get away with this for, for, for uh, so many years. Okay. So one of the things I sort of swept under the rug when I was talking about these bubble injections, if you remember the plot I was showing you about the flows, the flows we're typically getting in these, with these bubble simulations tend to be fairly high. They tend to be hundreds of kilometers per second. One of the long-standing basic assumptions that goes into the construction of the rise convection model and any ring current model is this thing called slow flow. Uh, typically, they're constructed by basically taking the momentum equation and throwing away the inertial part and just assuming some kind of force balance in the system. And that's used, for example, to calculate the magnetic field in the RCME, for example. It's also used to calculate the field-line currents in the so-called Vasilunas equation. 
that's used for calculation of the, of the, of the field line currents as well. Um, so um, that then is also used to construct the electric field. Um, so the question is, when you start getting flows of hundreds of kilometers a second, you're probably li li living on thin ice, and you're really not really modeling the physics of these things very well. So the question we've sort of been asking and trying to address is, how badly are we doing in terms of how the physics is going, in terms of modeling the physics of these bubbles, by throwing away this assumption? And I'll talk a little bit about that as well, in a second as well. Um, so just, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, one of the things that's also observed with these bubbles, just as, a, as, as an aside, is if you look at these bubbles as they come in, they come in because they're interchange unstable. There's low entropy, low entropy flux loops. They make their way in. They reach their equilibrium point, and at that point, they're no longer interchange unstable. But just like a swing at the bottom of its, its, of its, of its motion, it still has a significant amount of momentum. So typically what it does is, what it would do is basically overshoot its equilibrium position and oscillate back and forth. That's what you would expect. So observations by Themis, by uh, uh, Panov and all, actually found that if you plot the velocity, this is the Vx velocity as a function of time, what he found was that when these low entropy bubbles came in, and usually they're called dipole raising flux tubes, you can identify them by the magnetic field and so on, um, what he found was that the flow actually did oscillate and rebound and oscillate about some period. Um, and so one of the things that we've sort of become interested in is whether we can try to explain some of, this, some of these observations, especially these, these overshoot oscillations, um, using um, a traditional ring current type model. Um, and some of the background work that we've done is actually trying to model how these bubbles work. Some of the very early work that we've done uh, back in the 90s and more recently with a, a graduate student of mine is to use a simple one-dimensional filament MHD code that works on a background magnetic field. Uh, it's called a filament model. And what is, what, what, one of the features about this thing is because it has very low dissipation, you can actually track a, a, a motion of a flux tube very, very, very exactly. So here's an example of, of one I'm going to show you. Is basically what I've taken is I've taken a magnetic field model, a second anchor magnetic field model, equilibrated it, and then taking a flux tube, which is marked by this blue line, and I reduce its entropy by 20, 20%. It's therefore interchange unstable. So when I set the thing in motion, if this is actually going to play, what it does, it moves its way in and oscillates back and forth with a, a certain period. In this case, the period is of a few minutes, which, depending on the background conditions, roughly corresponds to the kind of oscillations that are seen in the Themis observations. In fact, if you try to match what's seen by Themis and you try to, try to um, uh, match the calculations that are seen um, using this thin filament, we can actually get reasonably good approximations. So we're sort of trying to understand what's going on in terms of the physics of these systems um, very well. What's the restoring force when the field line goes back out? It's, um, well, there's two, there's two things. That are, there's, there's pressure gradients and there's magnetic tension that are kind of fighting back and forth as well. But magnetic tension won't Right, but pressure, but, but pressure will stop it. So it's basically it's overshooting and restores back because of the magnetic field forces. So. so to address this, um, um, Dick Wolf and I and others have been working on a, a, a new theory of trying to understand what's causing these oscillations. Um, and we've come up with a very simple theory that's been looked at a little bit in the past um, on these things called what we call buoyancy waves. And this is sort of a relatively new kind of wave that basically has this oscillatory structure of, 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 um, of field lines that go back and forth. And so we've developed a sort of a, a, a very simple theory, basing, basically using a very simple magnetosphere. This is supposed to be a magnetosphere. This represents the ionosphere. These are field lines. And we assume that all the field lines basically move as one, so there's no angle dependence on the field lines. And these field lines are angled in the ionosphere. You go through the algebra, you calculate the actual ca equation that determines these waves, assuming that you have uh, waves that are basically of short wavelength, uh, perpendicular, but long wavelengths uh, parallel to the field lines. You come up with an equation that sort of looks like, which, which actually looks like this, uh, which has a very similar analog to uh, an atmospheric equation that describes gravity waves, or that, that describe, describe buoyancy waves, where the, where the buoyancy frequency is determined by gravity, 
in the magnetic field case, it's determined by the magnetic field configuration in the background, specifically the entropy parameter um, and the tension and the sp sound speed and the alphane speed um, in the system as well. So these waves are sort of a relatively unstudied way. I know Bill's done work, some work on that in the past. Uh, this theory has just been accepted. This paper has just been accepted in, uh, in JGR, at least for this simple analytic model. Um, and the thing that's sort of interesting about these, this kind of dispersion relationship is if you have a wave of a particular frequency, if the frequency is above this buoyancy frequency, which is a parameter that's determined by the background, background, background system, these waves dissipate. They, um, if it's below, they'll actually propagate within the magnetosphere. So what's of interest is that we're trying to understand where these waves actually propagate and where they're, where they're seen. If you try to do these, if you try to do buoyancy wave simulations in MHD codes, and we've done that, and we see them in MHD codes all the time, well, typically what you find is that these buoyancy waves they do come in, they they they, they balance, they oscillate back and forth, and you end up with a sort of interchange oscillation. But you typically only see two or three oscillations before they disappear. Um, and for a long time we thought that was because the MHD codes were no good. They had a lot of dissipation. They basically don't resolve the ionosphere. Um, it turns out there's actually another reason that these waves that you disappear is because if you launch a wave in a background median and let it propagate using the equations of motion, the waves actually disperse and become, um, they spread out and basically become smaller and smaller frequency waves. And this is a result of a simple analytic calculation using that wedge type magnetosphere, putting in a buoyancy wave perturbation and letting it, let it uh, evolve as a function of time. This shows the various waves at different times. And what finds is these waves actually disperse throughout the system. Um, so these buoyancy waves do actually disperse because of a good physical reason, not because of simple, um, simple um, dissipation in the system. More recent work on these buoyancy waves is actually now looking at trying to understand the normal modes that we see in the, in the, in the system taking this filament code. So we've derived a set of a simple, basically linear uh, dispersion relationship that describes the um, properties of these waves in the background system for the thin filament code that I was talking about a little bit about. And you end up with this sort of coupled, nasty looking coupled differential equation which describes the parallel and perpendicular motion of a field line if you, if you basically dis displace it from its equilibrium. Um, that basically can be used to use to calculate a uh, eigenvalue problem or normal mode calculation. Um, these parameters basically have these different parameters, which are called, which are variables which depend on the background magnetic field, field line curvature, and so on. Um, but if you place that into a uh, magnetic field model, compute the normal modes, you can you can actually try to extract, see if we can extract the normal modes of the magnetosphere, and specifically see if we can extract these buoyancy waves that are seen in the system. The way we did that was we take a magnetic field model, um, just a second anchor model, we add a, a pressure model, we run it through our 3D, this, this version 2D equilibrium code, we compute a very high fidelity equilibrium of the system, and we use that as a background, and then use that to calculate the buoyancy calculation of the system. So this is taking a second anchor 89, uh, a Spence and a uh, second anchor and um, Mackay pressure model, and then we also add a, a, um, a Gallagher type model for the, for the background density because the densities affect the system. When you do the normal mode analysis, uh, you basically pick a field line that has a specific equatorial crossing point. You end up with a whole zoo of waves called different, different, with different wavelengths, different frequencies. Here's an example of a wave um, showing, and I was just hard to read, I'm sorry, but this is the perpendicular mode and this is the parallel mode for the first eight eigenmodes that are seen uh, in the system. Typically what you find, at least for the near-Earth magnetosphere, most of these waves are uh, slow-mode waves uh, until you get down to here, where here you see a very large displacement in the parallel perpendicular direction and a much smaller displacement in the perpendicular direction, and that we think is a, is a buoyancy mode in the system which has a very specific frequency in the system. If you go out in the further, ta in the further out in the tail, uh, you find a very different system. Here you find not just buoyancy modes, but you also find flapping modes. This is an asymmetric mode. This is a function of S. This is the equatorial plane. So anything that's symmetric is a buoyancy mode. Anything that's asymmetric, like this one, is a flapping mode up and down, which we also see in the system. So here, the first buoyancy mode is shown in this, partic in this particular frequency range is here. So what, we, what we've done is we've taken 
a whole series of field lines starting from the inner magnetic sphere going out into the tail, and tried to compute the buoyancy frequency as a function of distance down the tail. With, and this, I think, is, you know, this is a fundamental property of the magnetic sphere. It's a very sort of different kind of wave that's seen in the system. And what you find is, as a function of distance down the tail, the buoyancy frequency drops um, quite, quite dramatically. So the, so the period gets much longer um, down the tail as opposed to near, near the Earth. We typically don't find anything near the Earth uh, for reasons we don't quite understand yet, which we're trying to figure that out. Um, and then you can add, then add a plasma sphere model. So this is basically assuming a density, a background density which is uniform, one particle per cc. Um, if we add a, a plasma sphere model where the density gets much larger uh, near the Earth, um, you find that the buoyancy frequency then actually drops, and you end up with a region between about um, 2 RE and, and about 10 RE where the frequency, uh, buoyancy frequency dro increases and drops. And this we predict is a region where, the, where waves that are basically in this region will be trapped between the plasma sphere, plasma sphere bound, or the plasma pores, and the outer plasma sheet. And they'll, and they'll basically oscillate back and forth between that region defined by this background magnetic field. Uh, this is sort of work in progress. We're sort of working on trying to understand what these modes are telling us. These are sort of, these are sort of relatively new results. But we hope to try to do this with, with different kinds of magnetic field models, even look at MHC models to try to see if we can understand, if we can extract similar kind of buoyancy type wave properties than this model is compared to the, to the, um, uh, to the theory. So um, one of the things that I want to do is, that, you know, we want, we, the RCM assumes slow flow. We basically would like to add some effect of um, inertia. Why do we want to do that? Well, the reason is, um, I think, illustrated by this plot. This is actually using this, an example of a, a, a simulation using this thin filament code where you can add different kinds of assumptions. The black line is basically what you do. You take a field line that it's about, uh, has its equatorial crossing point at about 11. You deplete it by a certain amount. It moves in and oscillates and damps um, as a function of distance, distance down the town. The damping is because of the ionospheric dissipation. If you then apply an RCM type formalism for, the, um, for a similar kind of flux tube, because the RCM assumes static slow flow, gets rid of the inertial term, there are no waves. Because there are no waves, you don't get oscillations, but you still get motion of the flux tube. So by adding an RCM approximation, you end up with a result that a field line actually does plunk and goes to its equilibrium point. It doesn't oscillate, it doesn't produce any of the oscillations that are observed as well. If you add an RCME, which is a magnetic field, you end up basically the same result. So the conclusion from this is that we don't get the waves. Okay, We get the equilibrium point right, because uh, interchange says that. But we don't see these kind of oscillations that are actually observed and, and are important for the physics of the inner magnetosphere. So the goal in sort of the, the, what we are trying to do next is, is can we actually modify the formalism that defines the RCM and add some effect of inertia? Okay. So what I want to show you is these are sort of relatively new results. This is kind of a new new work that, that, that Jane Yang has been working on on trying to add at least an approximation to what inertia is by adding inertial currents in the system. So the way the Rice convection model works in terms of the ionosphere is you have the standard equation of magnetosphere ionosphere coupling where you equate the divergence of electric field with the right-hand side, which is the field line currents, as calculated by the so-called Vassilinus equation. Okay. If you add inertia in red, you add an extra term, which involves basically motions of the field line, i.e inertial terms of effect. And this is, is so-called inertial current. So by assuming, making two critical assumptions that make this possible, we basically assume that if all the mass is concentrated in a flux tube near the equator, it's an assumption, and we also assume that communi communication between the equatorial plane and the ionosphere is instantaneous. Again, it's an assumption just to make this tractable. It turns out through some rather painful algebra that you can redefine the equation of MI coupling to include the effect of inertia by basically adding an extra term here which involves the rate of change of the conductance, which involves basically rate of change of the field line. Alpha and beta are the um, uh, Euler potentials of the magnetic field. Uh, this is the traditional Vassilinus term. This is the non-inertial term. This is the divergence of electric field. This and this are the inertial terms, which can be cast in somewhat like an, a, 
uh, conduct conductance tensor type form. So this equation here can actually be modified to include includes a sigma term, which includes basically a, an inertial like term. So basically, what you're doing is you're adding an, a mimic of, an, of, of a conductance effect from an inertial term, complicated nonetheless, but actually. Um, We've actually been able to implement this, and we've been able to do some first tests to try to see, to, should we get, do we get inertial type effects? Do we get oscillations that are observed in the system using this extra effect as well? So here's an example where we basically take a, a, a bubble, uh, deplete it at its outer boundary, and basically let it, let it move into the inner magnetosphere as a function of time. <clears throat> this is using a static background magnetic field just to keep life simple. But what you find is, if you run this thing again, um, bubble moves in, reaches its equilibrium point, and rather than stopping like it did before, it actually hits the inner magnetosphere, and it actually you do see some resemblance of what appears to be an oscillation in the magnetic field. This actually shows the velocity of the system, and you get this oscillation flow. If you look specifically at measurements, you do see these are basically velocity measurements taken at different x locations, so in the PV to the gamma the electric field, you see this oscillation structure that appears to be similar to the buoyancy type modes um, in the system as well. Uh, similarly shown here as well, showing the electric field and structure as well in, in the system as well. We've gone one step further and then added a background magnetic field which is based on an MHD code that we've developed where now the magnetic field is actually um, being provided by the magnetic, by, the, by an MHD code which also includes the effect of a, of a bubble. Uh, so you're basically trying to get a calculation. And this shows the motion of the bubble as it moves in, goes into the inner magnetosphere, reaches its equilibrium point, and again oscillates. If you look at the flow vectors, uh, you actually do see this kind of vortex type structure. I can show you here, for example, if you look at this particular time, you do see vortex type structures here associated with the bubble moving in. When it hits its inner magnetosphere, you, you see the reverse flow associated with the flow moving out and the overshooting of the system, again, consistent with what we think is going on with the, um, with the with a kind of oscillation type, type of structure. Um, this shows a later time, again, showing when it reaches in, in a magnetosphere, you see this vortex type structure, which is similar to what's observed, and at least mimicking some of the physical behavior that the inertial effects take place using this model as well, which I think is, which I think is good, to, which, is, which is, I think, very useful and interesting to have in the system. <clears throat> Again, looking at the equatorial plane, you're going to also see oscillations in the electric field. You also see oscillations in the, um, in the entropy parameter as well. If you look in the ionosphere, uh, you also see this bubble. Again, this is looking on the night side. Bubble being, launched from the, bubble being launched from the boundary moves in, goes to its inner region where it basically reaches the equilibrium point, and you see the associated field line currents and flow type vortices um, also in the ionosphere associated with this bubble as it moves in. Let me run this again. You see this bubble moving in, goes in, hits the inner magnetosphere, hits its equilibrium point, hits its boundary, overshoots, and oscillates a couple of times before it's coming to rest in the system. So we, we appear to be getting, I think, as an encouraging uh, initial results that seem to be showing that we can actually include inertial type effects in a, a code that's traditionally been uh, non-inertial uh, static by just simply adding this extra term in the field line current calculation. It makes the calculation a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated, but I think we're getting, I think we're getting some of the interesting physics that we've been looking for um, um, in the code. So um, just to sort of finish up here. Um, so what I hope to try to take home message, I think, is that the traditional view of, um, that's been around for many years, I guess, of uniform convection being a sort of a major source of how the inner magnetosphere behaves, I think has been replaced with a more, I think, dynamic and I think realistic view of the inner magnetosphere, um, which has a lot of important implications for how the inner magnetosphere is impacted by the, um, by the plasma sheet in the inside region. Um, bubbles, these bubbles can be used to resolve a lot of long-standing questions. For example, the um, the so-called pressure balancing consistency that's been that's been seen, getting in the, the the BZ minimum that's been seen, um, also the uh, a natural explanation for the growth phase of the system. It also we've been able to sort of basically show using a input boundary condition showing that you know, a significant portion of the ring current does come from these low entropy bubbles, even though intuitively you wouldn't think that. 
Um, and um, also, I think uh, we have an explanation for why the, the models that work in geosynchronous seem to work so well. It's because the boundaries where they are are well inside where the bubbles actually form as well. Um, this has led to a sort of a study, which I think is an interesting study of these so-called buoyancy waves, which I think is relatively unstudied in, in magnetic physics. And I think there's a lot of interesting physics that we can learn from that. We have a new theory, which is very simple. And we're just beginning to look at, investigate of some of the implications in physics of these systems. And from the knowledge that we've gathered from that and, and insight from that, I think we're, we're working to incorporate some new physics in the RCM, basically including uh, the effects of inertia for the first time. Um, again, preliminary work, but I think it's promising that we seem to be going heading in the right direction and putting in some interest in physics for, for, for the modeling of the magnetosphere as well. So <clears throat> with that, I think I'll stop and ask for questions. Thank you. What determines that velocity is, I think, um, I mean, we get we get that naturally in, in terms of the calculation. I mean, in terms of in terms of the flow speed, I think it's just the way the. I mean, MHD can give you gives you those velocities. I think it's just force balance. I think it would give you the, the velocities that you need. Um, the scale the. Or oh, force imbalance. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's force imbalance. It's right. moving in at a, at a speed that's at a, a few hundred kilometers a second seems to be a typical velocity when you have things that are out of balance. I mean, it's wave type speeds and so on. What determines the size? Uh, good question. Probably is, I, I'll push it back to something related to reconnection in terms of what's going on and what's, what's forming these things in the first place. Uh, it seems to be that, at least in the simulations that we have, we, we make them up. We put them on the boundary. We say they're that big because the observations say they're that big. Okay. In the MHD, they typically collapse down to the size of a grid cell. So if you make a grid cell the right size, they're the right size. It's typically what happens. <laughs> I've seen. Um, right, but it's only a few it just resolved. All right. Um, so I, th I think it's related to how they're formed, and it's probably related to, I suspect, the reconnection that's going on and the scale size of that. It determines how big they are. Um, gang? Yeah. So no question on the form field, but uh, yeah. of the electric train is they very steady and uh can be fair condition, northward steady, northward for a long time. So there's no such low bubble uh, the bubbles or low density flux structures coming. So does that mean there's no connection in the RCM? During northward IMF. Yeah, steady northward IMF. Right, right. Well, then, if you if you if you sub subscribe to the gospel that that the for that these things are actually formed by reconnection, then your X line is way down the tail. Okay, so you you think it's still there will be bubbles coming. Well, they they or they're not being made as quickly because reconnection is much so much slower, or the process of, that's making these things is a lot slower, in terms of the flow. The flow is basically stagnant. In this particular, in, in, in that in that situation where you have northward IMF, nothing much is really going on. You don't see bubbles. I mean, even in the MHD codes, you typically see these bubbles that are coming in from the night side X line during strong, steady state, strong southward driving. IMF turns northward, it just shuts down, and nothing happens. It just shuts down, and that's because in MHD, it's it's some kind of non-MHD process mimicking reconnection, I think. That's forming these things. It's not the only way you can do it, but that's certainly the, the popular way. Just to, for the RCM alone, yeah. if you have this uniform uh, input at a 12 or 15 I, it's yeah. uniform and the background density, what happens? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Have Nothing. Because you don't, you have a uniform bound. Yeah. You ha I mean, that's the, that first movie I showed you. It was a uniform boundary condition, but we, we, turned, we made the potential drop 120 kilovolts. We drove it for 12 hours, pushed it as hard as we could. 
tried to form a ring current, nothing happened. Okay? But once he basically allowed that boundary to fluctuate, he basically what he did was he, he cut a hole in the boundary, made a bubble, let it come in, then we got a ring current injection. Because it was interchange unstable, force imbalance, drove the thing in, it basically formed the ring. And, we, and what we did was artificially, assuming this is a storm, we basically opened up not just a bubble, we opened up a whole channel and let the channel, let, left the channel open for 12 hours. So it's like a fire hose that's sort of streaming in, comes in and builds up the ring current. And we got this huge ring current as a result of that. But uniform, nothing really happens in the system. It doesn't do anything exciting. <laughs> And the plasma sheet is never really observed to be uniform anyway. It's always, it's always bumps and wiggles and noise and flow bursts going on all the time. Uh, it's <laughs> so for the pointing wave part, yeah. do you expect the ions to get emitted as they should have? Yes. How do you do that? That's what the, this, was trying to, this was trying to show, I think. Um, So this is actually showing what we, what, this is the field line current here. That's the actual buoyancy wave, and these are the flow vectors associated. So you would see this sort of, uh, I guess, region one sense. Actually, it's region one and region two sense. Ahead of the bubble, it's region one, region two on the side as the stuff gets plowed in to the inner magnetic. So we see that all the time. Um, so you should see something in the ionosphere associated with that as well. So it's like a PCR, PC5 kind of wave? The frequency. I'm told, I'm not an expert on these, on these waves, but a PI2 is associated with PI2 waves. So the substorms Well, they appear to be associated with substorms, which substorms appear to be associated with bubbles, so you've got a connection here. <laughs> right. But they're not, I think they're not, the, they're not the only form of mechanism for PI2s, is my understanding. I'm not an expert on PIs. But they're certainly in that frequency range, and they have that structure. So, yes? Just a question about terminology. I mean, you're <coughs> talking about bubbles, you're, you're talking about entropy bubbles, right. but you're bringing something into the ring current, charged particles in, right. that are, so I think of that as not being a bubble, but actually an enhancement of, of charge being brought in. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 Plasma thermal pressure, thermal energy that you're bringing in into the system, but it's but it's you know it's low but it's low when you're out in the plasma sh sheet because it's a bubble. Um, by the time it gets into the inner magnetosphere because of adiabatic effects, the field line gets, gets much the footprint gets much larger. Then the PV of the game is conserved because V goes down, P goes up, so you get a much larger pressure. Ah. Okay, ah, okay, because of the geometric effect. Okay. okay. Uh, just a comment about bubbles. If you're a theorist, you call them bubbles. If you're a reserver, you call them flow bursts, or or or, or uh, dipolarization fronts, or they used to be called baby bursty bulk flows. I think the terminology is changing. Uh, <laughs> it's confusing. Yeah, that was what was confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good to see you. Have a good trip. Yeah. Okay, they said they could go to the Microsoft, so it'd be fine. I, I know him, so. <laughs>